Hey guys, John Paulamy here, Actionable Intelligence. Today is Saturday, September 28th, 2019. So, in this week's reality check, um, I wanted to talk about a book that I've been reading. It was recommended by one of the uh, viewers of these videos, and I can't remember who, who called it out, but uh, I did get it off of uh, Amazon Kindle and have been reading it. And the name of the book is The Art of Thinking Clearly by Rolf Dubelli. Dobelli, I don't know how to pronounce it. Anyways, um, this book basically goes through and talks about um, cognitive biases, incorrect thinking, illogical thinking. And what I like about it is it's broken up into small chapters of, of just a few pages and it goes over different biases or logical fallacies or these type of things uh, whether it's like confirmation bias for example or sunk cost uh, bias um, authority bias I'm just giving throwing out some examples and it's you can digest it in tidbits and it gives anecdotes uh, from the author's own life or just uh, from other folks experiences and I'm finding it very um, it's making me think a lot why I actually think that the advantage you know if you listen to guys like Charlie Munger um, some of these other guys that I like listening to Charlie Munger really talks a, a lot about Per the constant battle that he has, even though you know he's been very successful and he's got you know 90 years on this earth of constantly having to purge irrationality and biases out of his thinking. And I'm coming around more to the thought that the real advantage that successful people have, or especially if we you know distill this down to talking about investing and speculating, is that taking irrationality, thinking logically, thinking about the way things are, not the way we want them to be, is really the true key to success. I'm not saying that's all of it. Obviously, you do know how, you do know, have to know how to analyze companies and things like this, but I think a lot of these biases do creep in, and we see it in a lot of thinking that people do especially uh, I think most people think emotionally and you know you're never going to be able to get all of these biases out of your thinking we are who we are we have experiences we've adapted our way of thinking over years you know we get into these uh, defined methodologies that we go through but I think that you know a book like this does get you to think that when you're analyzing something, you know, are you introducing any logical fallacies or or any kind of biases that may be deleterious to having a positive outcome? So, you know, I'm just going to have some of the quotes here that I liked out of the book or just some out of the introduction. It was just kind of talking about why he wrote this book and in, in, in the background it says you know the failure to think clearly or what experts call a cognitive error is a systematic deviation from logic from optimal from optimal rational reasonable thought and behavior for example it is much more common that we overestimate our knowledge than we us underestimate it similar similarly the danger of losing something stimulates us much more than the prospect of making a similar gain. And there's research backing these things. I've, I've read this research before just in passing, but I'm actually, you know, kind of diving into this more to, th to really think about this and really do what Munger talks about, which is to try to identify those biases in my thinking and purge them. Um, as the author says here, this is one of the caveats, cognitive errors are far too ingrained to rid ourselves of them completely. And then he goes on to finish the introduction by saying, you know, the reason why he wrote the book. Indeed, my wish is quite simple. If we could learn to recognize and evade the biggest errors in thinking, 
In our private lives, at work, or in government, we might experience a leap in prosperity. We need no extra cunning, no new ideas, no unnecessary gadgets, no frantic hyperactivity. All we need is less ir irrationality. And I think that that is a good statement. I think that uh, this book only costs like nine bucks, guys. You should buy it on Amazon and read it. Um, you know, the guy, I think that's, sent me the link or sent me the um, recommendation says he reads it like once a year. Um, I, I do think that, you know, when you're making a decision or you're going through an analysis, you probably should think about these things. Uh, you know, we're seeing this really play out, I think, in real time with some of the things that are going on politically in this country or some of the biggest problems that we have in this country. And we've introduced all of these uh, you can kind of see it if you step back from it and kind of see some of these cognitive biases or this irrationality. Um, and, you know, I go back to you have to be careful about this because you can really mess up your life, I think, if you don't think clearly about things. You know, like I gave the example before, you know, when the Federal Reserve during the Obama administration was cutting rates and, 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 and pumping all this liquidity in the market, it didn't matter really what President Obama's political thinking was or his wanting to reshape the world or what he really thought about anything because so much liquidity was pouring in that the stock market went up and i know many people that refused to participate because they had such a bias against this socialist president that was born in kenya i mean it's laughable and that's just a kind of a an example of that i'm giving how much money was left on the table by people that you know had this bias I don't really care about the guy one way or another. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying you have to step back and look at these things because, you know, in the end, you're the one that's responsible and accountable for your life. No one's going to come down from on high and kiss it and make it better. And if you're waiting for that, you're going to be severely disappointed. So it's incumbent upon each of us to do the best we can. And in order to do that, I think that we do have to, you know, understand that, in fact, these biases are in our thinking. We all all are emotional and irrational at times, and we have to do everything we can to purge that from our thinking, at least if we want to be successful. All right, so I just want to get into a few items this week, tidbits. I thought this was extremely interesting. Uh, this happened last week. Scorpio Tankers, we've talked about it on here. It's a clean tanker company. Clean tankers are tankers that um, transport refined products. They don't transport crude oil. They refine like gasoline, jet fuel, uh, low sulfur fuel for ships, um, kerosene, whatever, naphtha. They, they transport the refined products from the petroleum refining um, process. And what was interesting here, you know, we've been, we've been talking about IMO 2020, the effective date being 1-1-2020. Just in summary, that means that the current dirty high sulfur bunker fuel that ocean going ships are using, they have to stop using that on 1 120. They have to start using low sulfur uh, fuels, which are a mixture of all kinds of different low sulfur. I'm not going to get into that. Just say low sulfur fuel. They can't use the heavy bunker fuel unless they go through a process of going in the shipyard and having a scrubber installed in the exhaust of their engines, which will pull the SO2 emissions, the sulfur emissions out of the exhaust stream. And we, as we talked about last week or before, why we're bullish on shipping, this is a catalyst in that, you know, there's not enough shipyard capacity to get all these scrubbers installed in time. And also the switch to this low sulfur fuel is not going, is going to be a chaotic experience as far as producing it at the refineries and then shipping it out to the various um, ports and areas where it needs to go. And what was interesting and in, about this whole thing last week was the president of the company, Robert Bugby, he purchased um, 1,500 call options on company stock. That cost him almost a half million dollars, and he did it at a strike price of 28, uh, and the expiration on these call options is January 2020. So basically, this guy's got short-term, three-month call options 
on approximately 1,500 call options, which represents about 150,000 common shares. Um, what he's saying is, what he's speculating on is the fact that his company's stock is going to be well in excess of $28 a share. I mean, for him to break even on this, the share price has to go to, because the call options were running about $4, uh, you know, $400 per uh option so he actually needs the stock to go to 32 just to break even and this is extremely bullish i've never seen a, you know i've seen company executives and insiders buy their stock because they think the um they think the stock's going to go higher over time you know obviously the people that run the company have are closest to the business and have their finger on the pulse so you would think that they would have the best information this is a, what would be called a speculation this guy actually thinks or what he's communicating here via his action is that he thinks that the price of his stock company stock a Scorpio tankers is going to be substantially higher to put you know a half a million dollars of your own money into these call options because if it's not above if it's not above $28 these options will expire worthless on the 17th of January 2020 so what he's saying is is that he expects basically way I interpret this is is that this particular executive feels that clean tanker rates are going to go very high in the next three months such that <clears throat> Scorpio tanker stock is going to move higher and that he's going to be able to sell his options at a very uh, high profit and you know without going into a bunch of discussions about how options work this is very leveraged play this guy is actually you know thinking that scorpio tanker stock is going to move substantially higher in the next three to four months um i think that you know some of the thinking here is that uh you know we're going to know by late october you know by the no end of november if clean tanker rates aren't moving higher then we're probably wrong about this whole 2020 thing but i don't think we are um, the stock has been moving higher recently. I think money's moving into this. Recent transactions that uh, Scorpio did where they just bought some more tankers from another company. Uh, they've actually lowered their, um, lowered their uh, age of their fleet. Uh, they're installing scrubbers onto their fleet. That's going to give them a cost advantage because they can, they can use the lower cost heavy sulfur high sulfur fuel so i think this is an interesting tidbit there's no guarantee of course but this is a this is a good telegraphed message uh that this at least the executives at scorpio or at least one of them thinks that scorpio stock is going to be moving substantially higher over the next three or four months kind of wanted to talk about this i just uh pull this off twitter let's not forget when we're talking about uranium the long-term thinking you know, on the supply or on the demand side, you know, we, I see people and I've read articles recently, you know, nuclear's dead. People are shutting reactors down. This is what really matters. What's going on in China, folks? You know, China basically will be the world's largest nuclear energy power by 2030. Um, I actually saw an erroneous article the other day where somebody said that, you know, the Chinese are, have stopped their nuclear build out. Well, they did for a while as they were, were, refining and um, basically getting their homegrown nuclear industry up to speed. But they've subsequent to that announced that they are turning the build cycle for new reactors back on. So this just, you know, gives you more comfort that, you know, in the end, you're going to be right. It's just, you know, you have to wait. So we've talked about that before. But when I see things like this, I like to... Uh, you know, it just reminds us of of one of the uh, sides of or one of the facets or reasons why we're invested in this. This isn't just China. India is doing the same thing, not to the same scale as China. They don't have the same resources, but they're doing the same thing. And we're just seeing a continuous, you know, growth in demand for new reactors. It's not going to stop. Another chart that I just wanted to show, um, you know, a life says so right here, so a life without fossils fuels basically is decades away. And you can just see again, you know, you, you just need to look at this. Here's renewables down here, this little green, this little green area here. It's even less than wood. And I, I wanted to show this because it's going to segue into what I'm getting ready to talk about, which would be boring for most people, but I think is very pertinent. And it goes into why I think we have an advantage on most people out there. 
you know, you see little rinky dink nuclear in orange here. It's hardly anything. Where's what, what, what keeps society running? Coal, oil, natural gas. That's it. Here's rinky dink green renewables. And most of that's hydro folks. It's not wind and solar. Although wind and solar are growing and here's wood woods, even more than renewables, you know, and I want to talk about that in the context of, you know, we've, we've had the, you know, I'm not going to get into it. I kind of let myself get dragged into it a couple weeks ago, talking about this Gretard or Greta, whatever I call her Gretard. Um, you know, she gets all this exposure and the irrationality. It kind of ties into what we just talked about, the irrationality of this whole crowd. And I kind of want to get into a book I've been reading, another book I've been reading. It's called Energy in the English Industrial Revolution. Now, this is a this is an academic book. It's uh, kind of dry, but I'm very interested in this because why? It's like, OK, how, you know, industrial processes. I'm in, I'm very interested in that. I like to I mean, I'm kind of weird like that. I like to like understand, like how steel's made, how the refining process works, how various industrial processes, you know, like that show that's on Discovery. How's it made? I like shows like I like that kind of stuff. And one thing you'll notice about things like this is the. You know, the Industrial Revolution transformed the human race. It allowed uh, a, a jump in prosperity, a ju jump in productivity, a jump in consumer goods and wealth that was unprecedented prior to that. And the thing that really singularly enabled that was the steam engine, with steam power, was coal, the use of coal. The ubiquity, cheapness, and available, and, and and just ease of use of coal. Okay, so we forget this, and I think this book is very interesting because it chronicles how this happened. You know, it says, you know, this is some quotes out of the book. All pre-industrial economies were organic economies, human and animal-powered economies. They relied on growth of crops for sustenance. You know, if you have draft animals, if you you know, increase your productivity on a farm by using mules or oxen to help you plow instead of just being out there hoeing the earth with a hoe. You know, you're consuming calories when you're doing that. You're human powered. You're out there with your little hoe hoeing, and you say, "Hey, I can hook this oxen to a plow once it was invested and invented, and you can increase your productivity, your production." But this was, you know, an organic economy. You have to grow a certain amount of food and fodder for the animals. You have to have a certain amount of food for yourself, caloric intake. And the land was a source of all materials, products of man. It doesn't just include the food, but, you know, woolen textile production and shoemaking. You know, it was from wool from sheep and shoes, you know, were made from leather, tanned leather from cow hides or various other animal hides. So where were they? They, they, they had to eat grass or fodder that was grown for them to produce these things. So it all tied back to the organic economy. And the same thing was true for the rudimentary iron making and pottery manufacture that, you know, we're digging up these pots from, you know, 3000 BC or different weapons that were made swords or tools that uh, these pre-industrial economies made. And they had to, you know, these, this is, these things are made by heat. You need a heat input to do this, to smelt the metals, to form the metals, to create the kiln for the clay to be cured in, to create the pottery. And they used wood and or charcoal, charcoal derivative of wood. It had to be used as heating sources for these processes. So you can see that the amount of wealth or the amount of pr products was limited by the availability of wood. So uh, this is right out of the book. Thus the production horizon for all organic economies was set by the annual cycle of plant growth. This set physical and biological limits to the possible scale of production. And you, know, you can't have a modern society like we live right now and go back to this organic society, organic economy. And we're going to get into that at the end. We're going to, you know, we're going to bring this logically to a conclusion. 
You know, above all, access to a mineral, i.e. coal and later petroleum, rather than a vegetable energy source, expanded the production horizon decisively, obviously. You know, if you're running coal power, if you're using, you know, coal in your heating processes, the availability as they mined more coal and found more coal allowed them to exponentially increase the production of these goods. You know, when we go back, I want to go back and touch on this, you know, now about if you, you, you know, you, you're not going to get away from this if you want a modern society. You know, the total quantity of energy arriving each year on the surface of the Earth from the sun is enormous, far exceeding the amount of energy expended each year across the world today. But in organic economies, human access to this superabundant flow of energy was principally through plant photosynthesis, i.e., how much wood. You know, I'm invested in, in, in wood in forests in, in, in New Zealand. And, you know, you can look this up. I mean, it's one of the best investments of all time. Why? Because wood on the stump basically increases by 6 to 8% a year. The tree grows 8 to 8% 8 a year. And I don't have to chop it down this year if, if, the, if the prices are low. I can wait till next year and prices get better. Then I can chop it down. And so it only is limited, the growth, the savings account, if you will. I'm saving up that photosynthesis, the ability of that tree to convert sunlight and take in CO2 to use a process of photosynthesis to increase the stumpage. That's what it's called, stumpage. So you, can, you are limited, these societies, these early pre-industrial societies were limited by just natural, the natural way that things work in, in the universe, physical limits of these processes. I mean, the author says it very succinctly, organic economies are limited by the inefficiency of photosynthesis. You know, this is the thing that I get interested in now. You know, he goes back to say, but this is just, these are rough calculations, of course. Two tons of dry wood yields the same amount of heat as one ton of coal. And he goes on to say, and this is because this is in reference to the Industrial Revolution in England. If half the land surface of Britain had been covered with woodland, it would have only sufficed to produce perhaps 1.25 million tons of bar iron on a sustained yield basis. Simple arithmetic, therefore, makes it clear that it was physically impossible to produce iron and steel on the scale needed to create a modern railway system or to construct large fleets of steel ships or to enable each family to have a car. If the heat energy needed to smelt and process the iron and steel came from wood and charcoal. So you see, we don't use coal and oil and gas, natural gas, because... We're evil and we want to destroy the children and we want to inundate the world with flooding. We use these things because they are necessary for our lifestyle. So what we are saying here is, is we have a direct threat from these Marxist eco-terrorists, these know-nothings. They put out this autistic Asperger's afflicted girl out there to shame us into going along with their policies, which I don't think they've thought through. This is simple arithmetic again. So it comes down to this, folks. Logically, we have if we follow the thesis that the combustion of coal and oil and gas is releasing sufficient CO2 that we are going to get into a run a, run away heat effect that's going to destroy the earth in 12 years, then we have to stop all industrial processes today. Think about what that really means, folks. We have to stop all industrial processes now. No more steel making. No more concrete production, no more refining of petroleum products, no more cars. How is that going to work out? No more industrial level agriculture. What that means is a mass die off of the population of the earth by who knows what, 95%. And we all go back to a organic economy where we rely on the sun and the weather patterns to grow sufficient wood and fodder so that we can all sit around spinning wool, 
with our little foot pumped spinning wheel while the men are out in the field with the oxen plowing uh, corn into the ground, hoping that the weather will be sufficient that we will not starve to death if we don't get a good crop. That's basically what they're saying. That's your choice. Or the other choice is to understand that we have these resources. We've created an unimaginable amount of wealth and easy lifestyle for ourselves. And that instead of looking for ways to better manage these resources or limit the amount of pollution, which we have done, the utility industry has, in the United States at least, has spent billions of dollars putting on SO2 scrubbers, removing mercury. I've been in arguments when I worked in the power industry on fossil plants with regulators who put, uh, you have to put so many sensors on that they get ahead, that regulators push the industry because they try to get you to put sensing equipment on and removal technology that doesn't even exist. It forces the industry to innovate to try to meet these high standards. We don't have acid rain anymore in the U.S. Mercury, you know, these things are detectable down to such small amounts that they're not even, they're negligible. And the process of cleaning up the coal, cleaning up the emissions is, that's what we've done. So your choice is to manage the resources and try to clean them up and understand that there's going to be a certain amount of pollution if you're going to have these lifestyles or go back to an organic economy and a population die off of about 98% and you know be growing your own food, making your own clothes and living what uh, I think Hobbes called a short, brutal, uh, you know, a cold existence. That's really what this is about. You know, if, if you're going to accept what these people are saying, so the, the question then becomes, is that really what the goal is? I don't think so. Not when I see grifters like Al Gore, the UN, it's, it's always, always, always creating a boogeyman that only the elites can solve and the way to solve it is to have all power vested in them and the ability to give them a whole crap load of money. That's how I see it. I'm not going back to living into an organic economy. I'm not going to do it. And most people won't either once they realize it. I think people should read the book. I'm not done with it yet, but it's amazing of what kind of leaps forward that mankind was able to make by shifting from a organic economy to a mineral-based economy. Now, is it sustainable on a finite planet? I mean, this is a ball floating through the universe. There's not unlimited amounts of these things, that, and that's correct. That's why we need to be good stewards of them. We need to keep pushing technology. We keep, need to keep looking for new ways to do things. But, you know, just allowing ourselves to be caught up in some emotional plea from a psychologically damaged teenager or these grifters that put her out there, I'm not interested in doing that. So that's it for this week, guys. I uh, hope you got something out of it. Uh, appreciate the support. Appreciate the, um, the uh, comments. And I'm sure that we'll see some good ones in this particular video's comments. We'll talk to you next week. Thanks, guys.